So this structure kind of blends in when you're just walking around, not looking very closely under these uh, junipers. But when you come in, this is like a dry land beaver lodge. It's huge. This is a structure that's been built probably not just by one generation, by, but by multiple generations of wood rats, also called pack rats. And I can tell for sure there's an animal that's living here because in this exit, there's a whole bunch of pack rat poop. There's also a, looks like another entrance area over here. But then on this other side, there's another entrance that goes down in between some rocks and another entrance here. So this animal's not gonna be trapped in here. If something's coming at it this way and trying to dig it out, it can get out that way. And I noticed a bunch of berries that have been eaten nearby. Uh, juniper berries, and I'm wondering if the this particular wood rat has been having a good feast here in amongst its junipers. There's a lot of cover the animals added, um, a lot of protection, and you might have heard of pack rat middens um, and people who study those in the Grand Canyon. Um, the pack rats will use the same area for uh, decades even, um, and some of that material can be used from the Grand Canyon, it's so well preserved, it can be used to, to look at um, the plant community that persisted in during um, thousands of years ago. So we started um, looking at this site this morning uh, when we came out pretty early, and we were in a lot heavier jackets at the time. You might notice we're wearing lighter clothing. So we're starting this lab with the end of the lab. So we've known, we know what we've seen today, but you don't know yet, and we hope you'll enjoy what you see. So, Kevin, good morning. Um, tell us a little bit about where we are and uh, about allotments and pastures. Uh, well, my name is Kevin Triplett. Uh, I'm a range management specialist here on the Flagstaff Rangers District on the Coconino National Forest. Uh, right now, we're on the Picket Padre allotment, and we're in the railroad pasture. Um, Sorry, what? <laughs> How many allotments are there on the Coconino that, that you're managing? Uh, so we, we manage about 23 active grazing allotments. I think we have one or two that are inactive, uh, Lake Mary being one and Mud Springs being the other. And how big is this allotment? I believe this allotment is uh, 55,000 acres. Um, okay, so uh, we're on the Coconino. We're out Lake Mary Road. Um, looking around at a lot of pine trees. I don't see any cows. Why are there no cows here right now? Well, the grazing season uh, typically doesn't start uh, in this area until June 1st is our on date. And that varies depending on where you are and what the climate's like. Uh, we do have two allotments that extend down into the Sedona area or the Red Rock Ranger District, which is uh, the Windmill and Windmill West allotments. And because the climate is warmer there, grasses grow uh, for a longer period of time. So we would graze them in the winter time. Uh, but here they don't start until June 1st. And how long do you graze up at this elevation? Uh, I believe it's like a four or five month uh, grazing uh, period. Um, here it would go from June 1st until October 31st. Okay, very nice. Um, okay, let me ask you, Kevin, what's the difference between an allotment and a pasture? The difference between an allotment and a pasture, uh, there's a series of pastures within an allotment, so an allotment is uh, kind of like a ranch, like it's a big group of pastures. And a pasture is just one, uh, I guess, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right word. Like a word. section? Yeah, like it's like a section of uh, land. And it, it typically just is, uh, the boundaries would just be a fence line that surrounds it. Why would you section off a pasture? Why wouldn't you just let the whole thing be open? Uh, it's, uh, it's a grazing tool. We so a pasture is a grazing tool within an allotment, so it allows you to use multiple pastures and uh, areas of land to graze specifically at a specific time of year. So, Mandy, can you tell us who the uh, permittee is for this allotment and how do they know what to do out here? How do they know what um, they can, how many cattle or, or other kinds of livestock they can graze? And, I've seen things like AMPs and AOIs and EIEIOs. <laughs> well, yeah. Can you describe a yes. little bit about the uh, person who is using this area or the people and um, AMPs and AOIs? 
Sure. My name is Mandy Resch and I am the District Range Staff on the Flagstaff Ranger District on the Coconino National Forest. And the producer who grazes and holds the permit for the Picket Padre Canyon allotment is the Hopi Three Ranch right now. And they've held it for quite a few years. And <clears throat> they are able to know how to graze and how many head of livestock to graze because of different documentations that we work with them to develop. And the first document is the NEPA decision, which is a decision notice. And in that notice, it's going to talk about the number of AUMs that can be grazed, the season of use that can be used, and the grazing rotation system that can be used, the grazing system that can be used. So there's other things that will be talked about in that decision notice, but really those are the big things that we look at year to year. Tiered off of the decision notice is what is called an, an allotment management plan. And all the information that is in the decision notice will also be in the allotment management plan. So that's going to be the number of heads you can run, which is tied to your AUMs, your animal unit months, the season of use that you can graze, the type of grazing system you're going to use, rotational, deferred, rest rotation, continuous grazing. Um, there's a few different ones there. And then tiered off of that are the annual operating instructions, also known as the AOIs. And those, of course, as it's in the name, is done annually with the producer. So that is when we determine how many head of livestock can actually be run that particular year. You might be permitted to run a thousand head of cattle, but maybe you had a drought winter, you didn't get a lot of snow, maybe a fire has gone through the allotment and you don't have the forage availability so you're going to have to back those numbers off. It could also be that the producer had to sell a chunk of his herd and he hasn't been able to build his herd up again. So he's going to also have to take fewer numbers. So there could be a number of different reasons why producers are not grazing at full permitted numbers. And the grazing permit uh, is another document that we use and that is also tiered off of the decision notice and it shows the number of head that can be run, the kind and class of livestock, the allotment that it's going to be on, and the length of the grazing season. Nowhere in there is it going to talk about really the day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year operations in the permit. This is just for the overall 10-year permit um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Length of time that the permit is uh, issued for. Because these are term grazing permits, which are 10 years at the most. Some can be issued for less, but we typically do not do that. Nice. Um, I'm going to switch back and then I'm going to come back to sure. uh, non use. Kevin, you mentioned that the pastures have fencing around them, and the whole allotment does as well. What kind of fencing do you use and why? Uh, we, we use a barbed wire fence and it's typically four strand and the bottom wire is smooth wire and we, um, we work with the Game and Fish and their uh, recommendation is that the fence is 18 inches high at the bottom uh, and that's so that the antelope can get underneath of the fence. Nice, because pronghorn don't jump. Right, right. <laughs> In the A, it's the AOI, right? In the AOI, I believe there's some non-use yes. that um, the permittee has requested. Can you talk about why would you be allowed to graze a certain number of livestock, but then you choose not to? Sure. Yeah, there's actually three different types of non-use that can be taken on an allotment during a grazing season. Uh, there is non-use for research, which we typically do not do. We don't have a lot of that. There is non-use for resource protection, and that's going to be used if it's been a drought year, if we've had a fire go through, maybe we did a timber sale and the allotment just hasn't come back the way we needed it to prior to putting cattle on. So for resource protection, we're going to hold off on grazing that area. And then there is um, personal convenience, and that is when the producer does not have the herd or it just is, doesn't not make financial sense for him to run full numbers that year and he is allowed to take um, either full non-use or partial non-use. So if a permit is for a thousand head of cattle and on any given year they want to graze 500, they're going to be taking 50% non-use 
and that would be the same as if we said you can't run full numbers because half of your pastures can't be used therefore you can only graze 50 percent of permitted numbers so for resource protection reasons you're going to take 50 percent non-use what are the major what is a c3 and a c4 grass and a cool season warm season can you briefly explain that and is one better forage than the other and what are the major c3 and c4 grasses sure. in Arizona? Yeah, so what we see in northern Arizona is a pretty decent mix of C3 and C4 grasses. C3 grasses are also known as your cool season grasses, and they're going to start coming up, greening up, booting out in about the May, June, early July area, depending on precipitation. Your C4 or your warm season grasses, they're going to start coming up in like June, July, and go through August. And once you get into the September, October time period, you may see your cool season, your C3 grasses, starting to green up again because the temperatures have gone down. And this really helps us determine how we're going to rotate cattle through the pastures of any given allotment. One of, what, one of the things we don't want to do is graze the same pasture at the same time of year, year after year. Because that means that if that pasture is being grazed in the beginning of June, year after year after year, it's the cool seasons in that pasture that are going to be hit hard by the livestock. And what we want to do is make sure that we're switching that around year after year so that those cool seasons in pasture A have time to grow from being grazed in June in year one and that they have time to grow a whole growing season and then probably not be grazed again until August of grazing season two. It just gives them that chance to recover. And the same for the warm season grasses. We want to move it around so that the warm season grasses aren't always being grazed during the same time of year. So when it comes to which one is a better forage, it seems that the C3, your cool season grasses, are better to digest for livestock. Um, and you don't see that as much in the C4 grasses. In northern Arizona, our main C3, our cool season grasses, are going to be your squirrel tail, your western wheatgrass, your Arizona fescue, uh, your pine drop seed and your crested wheatgrass and that's those are very prominent around and you'll see them greening up in May and June like I said. Our warm season grasses are the blue grandmas or any of your grandmas and any of your muleys such as mountain muley, spike muley, Wright's muley. Um, you'll see those around and those will start greening up in July. Why would the permit require consideration of wildlife such as Mexican spotted owls and eagles? I mean, what's a cow going to do to an eagle? Um, what, what does the permit, re permit require the permitting to do? I don't have to worry about that part, but why would we have spotted owls and eagles on this livestock grazing permit? Well, uh, any, any, life, or any wildlife is, uh, you have to take into consideration with any of the permits, as well as uh, archaeology, roads. The Forest Service is a multi-use agency, uh, so it's not just about the livestock or just about the wildlife, it's all together, so every interest uh, needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, so to tear off of what Kevin said, um, when we are looking at an allotment that has packs in it, protected area centers, protected activity centers, or bald eagle roosts, we want to make sure that we don't disturb those animals as much as possible. The use of chainsaws or going out and constructing new or reconstructing fence can be the problem if you're going through a pack or if you're near a bald eagle roost. So we require producers or permittees as they're also known to not do any kind of construction during the breeding season which is March 1 through August 31st. So this limits their ability to maybe cut some trees down to protect a fence or to go out and fix some fence in certain areas but they can do that off after August 31st and as long as they're planning ahead of time we can make sure that this kind of work can get done. Okay, describe three reasons that uh, the AUMs uh, which we calculated in class for this total allotment, which was 2,180 cows or 10,900 sheep. Three reasons why that many animals are not allowed on this allotment. I'll take this one. Is that good? Yeah. So when I am doing the NEPA analysis for grazing allotment, one of the things I'm trying to figure out is how many head of livestock and what kind of livestock can be run on this allotment. And the things I'm looking at are slope, your topography, uh, the soil condition, the available forage, and also what kind of wildlife is out here that's going to be competing and grazing at the same time that the livestock will be grazing. So 
when I'm figuring out the AUMs at that level, at the NEPA level, those are the main things I'm looking at. And um, we're also going to take into consideration at that time a 35% utilization guideline for, um, for what the cows can eat. So when we look at that 35% utilization of forage, that leaves an amount for wildlife, such as elk, and enough to cover and protect the soil. So that is, those are the main things we're looking at. Forage production, the amount of utilization, topography and slope, same thing, and soil condition. Now when I'm looking at it on a year-to-year -year basis, I'm going to take into consideration um, if there's been drought that year, that winter, if something else has happened, like a timber sale or a fire, and then coming out and looking at the canopy cover. We don't look at that during the NEPA process because that does change more frequently than we do NEPA. But if you come out on a yearly basis, you'll see that some areas are going to have a very close canopy cover. And if you look at it, there's not a lot of grass growing in that area. You pretty much just get pine needles. So you don't have that forage availability. Uh, so those are the things we're going to look at when we're figuring out AUMs at the NEPA level and then AUMs on an annual basis. Good. And we might want to come back to that. Okay. I'll get one more quick question in now. Um, so, Kevin, I believe you travel around out here some. Um, what noxious weeds do you feel are the worst that you have to deal with? Uh, jeez. Sorry, did I put you on the spot? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I know I toad, toad flax is, is one. Uh, it's hard for me because I, I come from Nebraska and I look, <laughs> I get like hung up on mullein. Well, which isn't a big deal out here, but <laughs> yeah. I, I like see that and I like, I stop what I'm doing and I'll like literally circle around in GPS uh, stands of mullein because I'm like, this should, this is not a good deal. This should not be out here, but it's really not. You could make some money right now. Because yes, mullein, you could. Yeah, you know why. Yeah. Yeah. Toilet paper. I, oh yeah, no. I'm <laughs> mullein is the uh, desperation toilet paper yes. in the woods. Gotcha. It really is. I did it's not know that. <laughs> Oh okay. yeah, it's uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, you can't that's a great there. answer. Um, <laughs> okay, good. so toad flax, uh, napweed, jointed goat grass yep. um, that require herbicide grubbing or biocontrol treatments, but really we don't see a whole lot. But so, what kind of uh, and leafy spurge do you see out here? Uh, toad flax and leafy spurge are two of them that we see out here, and napweed is another one as well. So and I you do. don't like mullein. <laughs> and, and I do not like. Mullen. <laughs> okay, let's I did not I didn't really answer that.